This is Chris Collinsworth. Be sure to check out the PFF College Podcast as our experts provide insight on all the league's top stories. Every game, every player, every play. Download and subscribe on iTunes or your favorite provider. Hey everybody, welcome back to the PFF Podcast. Uh, This was going to be just a PFF short to react to the Pro Bowl, but the Pro Bowl being what it is, this was going to require more ranting and more length than your typical PFF short. So we decided that rather than just be me ranting for an hour, we'd get Mike back. And me and Mike would talk about the Pro Bowl and everything that's wrong with it. So let's start, Mike. Um, The Pro Bowl has been announced We're going to get to, you know, snubs and guys that are there that shouldn't be there in a minute. But let's first start with everything that's wrong with the actual process, because that's always the most fun bit. Because when we were were doing the the ballot, you're actually actually restricted to stupid um, picks by the way that they are on the ballot. Guys are in the wrong position. Guys are in positions that don't really mean anything. There's arbitrary designations between strong and free safety it, it's just a mess at the moment positional designations make absolutely no sense in this when you when you have guys like von miller at the exact same position as someone like sean lee when they're not even they're not even close to doing the same things it's ridiculous and then when you split up guys like reggie nelson and eric weddle into two different positions when they're pretty they're almost doing the exact same thing in terms of coverage it's just, it makes no sense, and it screws guys who are deserving, and you know, shoe, shoehorns in guys who maybe aren't deserving at times. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a couple of different problems. There's the the outside linebacker defensive end issue that we've that the the All Pro has actually fixed this year. The Associated Press are fixing their All Pro team precisely because of this problem. Because the way the game is developed now with teams split between 3-4 and 4-3 schemes, but essentially all running the same thing in terms of where these guys line up, the designation between outside linebacker and defensive end has become meaningless. So you get guys that are edge defenders, whether they put their hand in the ground or stand up, they're in exactly the same spot, but they're being separated on the Pro Bowl ballot depending on where they line up or what base scheme they're in. So like you said, you get guys that essentially are being thrown into two completely different categories um, or into the same category despite being in completely different positions. Um, And you get that again with the defensive interior guys, defensive tackle versus defensive end. You're comparing 3-4 defensive ends and 4-3 defensive ends, which is basically edge rushers and and interior guys. So it's just a mess. Um, But the the all-pro guys are fixing it. They're going to have this year, what we've been doing for years, which is um, interior defenders, edge uh, edge defenders, and linebackers, um, and you know these off the ball linebackers separate the guys that uh, separate the the Sean Lees from the Von Millers, um, mm-hmm. and that I think needs to be done. But the other issue that the Pro Bowl ballot has is that I don't know who puts the ballot together, but they just have guys in the wrong position. They have guys that are not playing where they're being listed. So when you look at the Jets and you have um, Leonard Williams being listed as a defensive end, and then you have other guys on that roster that actually play more outside than he does are being listed as defensive tackles. I mean, they just have guys that the the position designation they have bears no resemblance to where they're actually playing um, when you look at how they're lining up snap to snap. Yeah, Leonard Williams, like, he doesn't take any snaps, basically, outside of the tackles. He only had, like, about 100 this year. Yeah, and I think and Jordan then, Richardson was the guy that was being listed yeah. as a defensive tackle, and he's the opposite. And he's the one he's, who's he's the guy that's mainly, on the edge. And, and we've heard teams say that they give, you know, those edge guys freedom to either put their hand in the dirt or stand hmm. up, depending on what. And, you know, they're making the distinction that if a guy's standing up, he's all of a sudden an outside linebacker when – He's, you know, he could just as easily put his hand in the dirt and all of a sudden, boom, he's a defensive end. It it makes, you know, very little sense to make that drastic categorization. I I don't agree with it. I think pretty much everyone doesn't agree with it at this point. And the the thing, the the sad part is why we like argue about this and why it matters is because 
this gets used for contract negotiations. This gets used for, you know, contract escalators. This gets used for Hall of Fame candidacies, things that, you know, have some, you know, more meaning at this point. And so it actually does matter. Uh, and I want to get to another point down the line, but it's a, it's a farce at this point. Yeah, I was going to get to that point because, you know, after a few minutes of hearing how broken it is and everybody knows that it's it's ridiculous at this point, your first question is, well, who cares? It's just the Pro Bowl. And, you know, it's it's it, it, it does matter. It comes up in real situations. And the first thing you hear about a guy when he comes up for Hall of Fame negotiations, this guy was a 10-time Pro Bowler. And now you're getting to the point where you wonder, what does that mean anymore? I mean, there are guys that are there. You can be a 10-time Pro Bowler, and I'm not not sure you have to be above average as an NFL player at any point in your career to achieve that. Um, There are guys now that we're watching, having been grading for that long, that are perennial Pro Bowlers that have probably never deserved to actually make it there. And that's before you get to the actual material benefits of, you know, these guys are getting a nice free trip to Hawaii or... You know, there's there's some perks attached to it that, you know, for some star players, it may not be a big deal. It's nothing. But for some guys that are toiling lower down the roster, but put together a fantastic season, those guys deserve that. You know, and they're getting screwed out of it by a system that's become ridiculous. Yeah. Well, my last point that we that we haven't even crossed the bridge we haven't crossed yet is the fact that in, you know, a month's time when it actually comes Pro Bowl, 30 guys are going to drop out and 30 new guys are going to take their spots. And all of a sudden those guys, those new guys that all got selected, all get pro bowl on their, you know, on their history. They were pro bowl selections, even though they were third alternates and ended up making it in the end. That doesn't, uh, that doesn't get recorded in history. You know, when 10 years down the line, they're going to have XX and X pro bowls, even if they weren't even close to getting voted in initially. I think one of the big issues that has, is really affecting this, um, you know, the, the Pro Bowl has been waning in terms of popularity and, and how much it draws and TV ratings and all that kind of stuff. And they're desperately casting around for ideas to try and fix it, you know, with this, like, Deion Sanders and Jerry Rice picking teams and, you know, moving so- it from Hawaii to wherever they moved it and back again. And now they're introducing dodgeball to the Pro Bowl week. Somebody, by the way, is going to tear their ACL playing dodgeball, and it's going to be the most ridiculous thing ever Robert to happen to the Pro Bowl. Yeah. Um, and I think a big problem is that it's become so ridiculous that the, it doesn't mean anything anymore. The participation, who is actually being selected and lining up, it's no longer an all-star game. It's whoever's left at the end of the season that's still standing that can be bothered to go on a plane trip to Hawaii and kind of cash the ticket of this trip knowing they need to play in this meaningless game. So... You know, it's not this all-star encounter of AFC versus NFC anymore. It's just kind of some vaguely good guys that you happen to have collected through this ridiculous system. No, and they very much need to just basically do away with the game. It's the game, the hitting part itself, because no one wants any part of it. No one wants to get injured. No one wants, I believe, was it Eifert last year who actually got hurt in it and then missed a part of this year? No one wants that to happen to anyone. So uh, when you see, you know, college players skipping bowl games like you have to think nfl players are seeing you know the fact that this means nothing to them in terms of their career this like they can only lose basically uh they can only there's only something something to lose by playing in the game so i I think the game at some point in the next 10 years will probably be you know basically done away with in terms for in lieu of like skills challenges and whatnot that they've done this year it used to be a case of it being, you know, a relatively fiercely contested game, though. I mean, guys used to go out and do the hitting, and it was just another... It was an all-star game, and there was fun attached to it. But, you know, it wasn't the case that 20 years ago, um, you know, back in when Barry Sanders was playing or whatever, everyone didn't treat this as this chore, this scourge that could potentially wind them up injured and cost them money. Is this just a, a kind of a reflection of today's world where everybody is focused on this contract and you know the risk and all this kind of stuff as opposed to just taking it for what it is which is this end of season you know celebration game yeah i mean it definitely is a change in culture in terms of looking but but it's for a reason i mean it's changing culture because guys realize like i just said there's nothing to gain from it yeah you can yeah it'd be fu- it's fun to play in another game but at the same time you get hurt you career ends from a you know a game like that all of a sudden you know it's not it's not as much fun anymore and people are starting to catch on to the fact that 
there's really no upside to, you know, dominating a Pro Bowl. Yeah, and I guess the 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 number of zeros attached to it are, is bigger now than it's ever been. You know, back, in, you know, if you go back far enough, you're just not dealing with large enough sums of money for people to start going, mm -hmm. okay, we probably need to think about what we're doing here. Whereas when you're suddenly putting a $100 million contract on the line, if you screw something up and, you know, you tear something in the course of the game, then I guess that focuses your mind a little bit more. Um, yeah. But let, so before we get into all the issues of this particular Pro Bowl roster, I want to talk about the voting process and how ridiculous that's become. It was bad enough when you turned it into a popularity contest by essentially turning it into a fan vote, or at least having a fan vote count for, I think, a third of the, um, the ballot. This year, <laughs> they opened it up so that retweets on Twitter counted towards the Pro Bowl ballot, which is one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard of if you actually want the guy on the other end of that to make to be the right choice. <laughs> you know, I mean, some even just... I think that's... I think you just said it right there. I don't think they care about getting the right choice. It's more about thing. promoting the game itself and that's getting, you know, viewers to it. That's the root cause of all the problems, I think, is that they don't care who goes. You know, if you want this to be an all-star game, you need to actually care that you're picking the right people at the end of it. Um... And even if you just look at, like, the number of Twitter followers attached to each NFL team, like, some of them are, like, three times, you know, yeah. dramatically more <laughs> than the others. It's just, it's just patently unfair. Um, but the interesting thing is, so, you know, let's assume that the fan vote is a bad idea, you know, as much as everyone wants to vote for their favorite player. In terms of actually selecting the right player, it's a horrible way of doing it. It's never going to work. But... I'm not sure that the coaches and the players are dramatically better situated to, to, to vote correctly either because, you know, when you talk to coaches and players, these guys are not watching the rest of the league all the way through the year. They're watching upcoming opponents. And even then, a lot of the time, they're only watching like four games of upcoming opponents. So you're, you're looking at a really, really narrow window of opposition play um, to be able to judge an entire NFL's worth of performance. You know, as much as it seems like these guys have the most knowledge out there, they probably don't have the most... It's probably too narrow focused for it to be the right group of people picking the Pro Bowl. Yeah, you get... So with the fans, you get basically whoever has the most, you know, whoever has the best PR team, whichever players are the most popular. With coaches and players, you get whoever has the best reputations around the league. You know, who's the guy, who's the offensive lineman, who's, you know, the Joe Thomas, the Tyrants, but the guys who... It, you know, regardless if they are having the year that they've always had, it's basically this guy is this level of play. So we're voting him to the Pro Bowl, even if, you know, even if he had a down year and it wasn't quite the same and some guy, some new guy came onto the scene and all of a sudden, you know, had a breakout year. That, I think that's why we see a lot of, you know, guys who do have breakout years rarely, if ever, make the Pro Bowl because it's just, you, you know, you, it takes a little bit to get that reputation around the league to all of a sudden be like, okay, this guy's, you know, one of the best, you know, Geno Atkins took him a little bit to get into generally accepted that he's one of the best defensive tackles, even if he should have deserved a few pro bowls before he ever got to that point. It's usually at least a year. The, the pro bowl mm -hmm. operates at a year lag compared with actual on field performance. You get a guy have a great, a great season. He's not going to get anything that year. The next year, he's probably going to go to the Pro Bowl, whether he deserves it or not that year. It's a bit weird. Um, but I keep coming back to this. I don't know who should be picking the Pro Bowl, you know, because I don't think that, obviously, the fans who decided they shouldn't be doing it, the players and the coaches, I don't know. That's a great idea. I don't know that I trust a huge amount of sports writers to be doing it either. And I, I kind of keep coming around to this that I don't actually know who should be making these choices. Not you. That's no, for sure. Obviously. You picked Russell Wilson for MVP, so. Hey, Russell Wilson for a few <laughs> games was, was MVP right there. Um, but, like, who, you know, what's in your ideal world, who picks the Pro Bowl? Uh, pro Scouts. Is that, you know, like NFL Pro Scouts? I but, think I mean, that those guys be... have the same problem. They're not watching upcoming opponents every single, you know, they're, they're not watching the league-wide. Um, Are they not? I mean, I, I thought so. that's, like, the definition of Pro Scouting. But I think they're focused. They're not just... You know, okay. those guys are not just. Yeah, I mean, I, a comp I do uh, agree. You know, that. a complete compartment of every game that's played and compiling endless, you know, they're focused on whatever, you know, we've got a set of team needs. We need to stay looking at these guys. We need to prepare potential uh, roster bubble guy profiles. You know, it's not like <laughs> those guys don't just have a job watching football over the course of the year. 
you're uh, I feel like you're trying to get me to say PFF should be picking it, but then how would we what would we have to complain about Sam? Well, we, we can't we can't say you that. That yeah. would look that would look very uh that would look very <laughs> um I don't know what the word is. It wouldn't look good. It wouldn't look good. We can't we can't be championing yeah. ourselves like that. Um so let's let's have a look at what this process has um produced this year. And I want to start in the most insignificant way possible because that's the special team uh position which you know, Gordon won't be happy at that. Gordon, Gordon loves I like how it's just teams. one, too. Well, one special not only teamer. is it just one, but <laughs> if ever a position should not have anything to do with anybody's vote, it's special teams. Because <laughs> clearly nobody has any idea how special teamers are actually playing until you, you know, genuinely look at some way that it's collected and tabulation and stuff. Matthew Slater went to the Pro Bowl because essentially Matthew Slater is one of the five special teams players in the NFL that people can name. So when you go to the Pro Bowl yeah. ballot, it's, oh, look, there's Matthew Slater. I know his name. I'm writing it down because I don't know who the other guys are. Um, Matthew Slater this year, more missed tackles on special teams than solo tackles. I would so, suggest that Matthew four, Slater four missed tackles, would not make the tackles. top five of the New England Patriots special teams players this year, let alone the conference. Um, but like I say, he's the guy that everybody knows. He's, a, he's name recognition. Um, and the other thing about special teams is that like the the way the ballot is, they only have one or two guys per team. When you know, I don't know, special teams units are what, like a dozen guys at least. Yeah, I mean, it's a full. Yeah, it's, it's everybody that's it's not playing squad. plus a bunch of guys that are playing on on offense and defense. So you can go through. You know, I was looking at the the PFF special teams grades, um, and I was going through the ballot, and you're like, no, can't put that guy on the team because he's not on the ballot can't put that guy on the team he's not on the ballot you have to go and find which guy has been nominated for for each team and then find the best one of those to go so you know we i think had michael thomas from miami as as one of our special teams um guys and i who do we have for the nfc i wanted to put eric weems but he wasn't available uh jaquiski tart which by the way that's an awesome name um but for the san francisco 49ers went um, and a lot of it is the case of, you know, those are the best guys that were actually on the ballot. But, I mean, special teams should be a case of, you know, somebody who's actually watching special teams, who knows all these players, chooses two special teamers, one from each conference. Because Even just take the guys with the two most tackles yeah. <laughs> on special teams. Just, like, tabulate tackles and then take those guys. Because, I mean, those are guys who are actually producing something as opposed to, you know... <laughs> What else? You, if you're not a kicker, punt returner, basically all you're trying to do is make a tackle. I, I don't know. Yeah. And these are <laughs> it's but these more are, accurate. The special teams thing is the thing that annoys me the most because these are the guys who are earning nothing. You know, the special there are guys out there that are you know even special teams <clears throat> aces that are dedicated special teams players. Those guys are earning veteran minimum. You know, those are guys to whom uh, an all expenses paid trip to Hawaii actually means something significant, as opposed to you know the the star quarterback who's already earning twenty million a year. What does it matter to him? But those are the guys I think that we owe it to actually get right and to take someone that's playing really well as opposed to just the one special teamer that you recognize the name from. Mm, agreed. Um, yeah, Matthew Slater not even making $2 million this year. And he's like and he's Mr. Special the most, Teams. Yeah, the yeah. most well-known and probably <laughs> most well-paid special teams guy out there. Um, yeah. But you wrote an article after the Pro Bowl, the 10, or was it 10? Six biggest snubs. Six. Six biggest snubs. Who do you have as your biggest snubs? Uh, let me take a look. I, <laughs> I had Andrew Luck. Andrew Luck was a snub. I, he's having his best year of his career. I don't care what, you know, what's going, what else is going on around him. Offensive line has really been an issue this year, more than probably years past. Uh, when, they, when they've had those backups out there, those guys have been a nightmare. And the fact that he had Ben Roethlisberger ahead of him, I mean, it was crazy. Roethlisberger really not having a good year by any stretch of the imagination. And the funny thing is, Luck and Roethlisberger had the exact same number of pass attempts this year. They both have 476 pass attempts. But, you know, Luck has more yards, more touchdowns, fewer interceptions. Basically, any stat you can look at, Luck has been better at. So it's a direct comparison, like, and it, everything tilts Luck's way. You know what the one stat is that he doesn't have the lead in? I'm going to go with quarterback wins. There you go. Quarterback <laughs> wins. That's what. That's the only thing I can think of that has Roethlisberger above Andrew Luck. No, because if you're watching anything this year, it, it's clearly not not that way. And uh, I'll be, anyone listening to this probably already knows that quarterback wins is a farcical way of measuring anything. But if you needed 
further clarification, Brock Osweiler received a quarterback win for getting benched, like, I don't know, after two interceptions <laughs> and however many snaps he was out there for, against uh, Jacksonville. Tom Savage comes in, leads them back Saves to a them. win. Nothing. No quarterback yeah. win for Tom. One quarterback win in the column for Brock Osweiler. Uh, Should have started the game, Tom. Like, I mean, what is he, 8-3, and 9-3, something like that? Oh, he's one of the best quarterbacks of all time, yeah, apparently. Yeah, in terms of QB wins, <laughs> but he's just been benched and sat down, and you know his $72 million yeah. contract has been decided as a, a waste of money. So, yeah, QB wins, not a great way of measuring your quarterback. All right, next one, I had Matt Paradis, Paradise, whatever. We, we still really didn't get confirmation on that. And then uh, <laughs> over Marquise Pouncey. Not no. This one's no knock on Pouncey. Paris is having a fantastic season. Like the the dude's been lights out from start to finish. I know the rest of his line has absolutely crumbled, and that's probably what hurts him in this case. The fact that the Broncos' offense line has just maybe one of the worst reputations in the NFL currently. But man, the, the dude's getting it done at, at center. I, I think he should have deserved it. Pouncey, by the way, is one of those guys that is going to be like a ten time oh, and Pro Bowler, yeah. and I don't know if he's deserved it one season yet. Um, and I know this is a thing that PFF hates Marquise Pouncey, and it really isn't the case. PFF has graded Marquise Pouncey above average in, I think, every single season of his career. The problem is that there's a big gap between above average and Pro Bowl, and he has never bridged that gap, at least in no, my eyes. I wrote in the article, I wrote actually later with Brandon Scherf, who made it over Josh Sitton, that if you're a top 10 pick, a first round pick at guard or center, and you're not a bust, you know, you play well at all you're a 10-time Pro Bowler all of a sudden because, you know, you're the only name anybody knows, anyone recognizes, you know, on national TV. When they talk about your offensive line, they highlight you because, you know, you're a name at this point then. And you don't have to actually play at the elite, elite level to make any Pro Bowls or all pro teams. You all of a sudden just get shoehorned in there because you're the only name people know. You just need that first one. You come in yep. as a, a first-round pick. As soon as you get the first one, you can start cashing those tickets every single year to, to the Pro Bowl. You are going, unless your team goes on like a 1-15 run, in which case your, your offensive line is probably being blamed yep. for it and you're not going to get selected. But basically, if you're on a halfway decent winning team and you were a first-round pick, you're going to the Pro Bowl on the offensive line because people just don't know any better. Um, and exactly. That's part of the problem. Like we've been talking about this whole thing, it's being – it's just being done on reputation and name recognition. It's not being done on how guys are actually playing. So, you know, let's say, I mean, Marquise Pouncey's career is like how many seasons old now? Six. Um, he could end this season, like say a 15-year career. Let's say he goes to the Pro Bowl 12 times, you know, misses three times. You're talking about a guy who goes into the Hall of Fame um, and may never has five been, Pro Bowls. There you go. He, so let's say, yeah, 10, 12 Pro Bowls by the end of his career. He go he could go into the Hall of Fame, and it's entirely plausible that he could never have been above average in his entire career and wind up as a Hall of Famer. And it makes mm, question, That's not fair. I mean, he's above average. It's he, never how been. Much? Oh, he's definitely above average for a center. I mean, he's a fairly good center. He's just not He's not a dominant okay, center by any means. Okay, never been above, above average. Okay, yeah. Never been an elite center. Never been a top three center. Yeah. Which you would better. think at some point during your career, you'd be a top yes. three center if never you're a Hall of Famer. Never been better than above average slash good. Mm -hmm. He's never been. Anyway, but it may never have deserved a single Pro Bowl. Could end up with 12 of them by the end of his career and wind up in the Hall of Fame. And it makes you wonder how many guys are currently sitting in the Hall of Fame for which oh, that man. is also true. Yeah, I mean, O-line scouting back in like the eight, like, uh, I, it had to be... It had to be worse than it is today. Like, it couldn't have been better, could it have? <laughs> like, I mean, yeah. I guess the one thing in their favor is that the fan vote wasn't part of it. So it was being done <laughs> purely on the basis of essentially reputation and yeah. you know, the, the fleeting games that you saw of opposition or whatever. But back in the day, that would have been less. You know, you're dealing with tape and it takes longer and there's no communication and you're not watching the nationally televised games every single opportunity. You know, it's going to be tougher to find guys. But, you know, who knows how good somebody like John Hanna or, um, you know, all those old guys actually were. Those, <laughs> I mean, I don't want to label anybody, but there's pretty yeah, entirely, out, plausible, <laughs> entirely plausible there is a bunch of guys sitting in the Hall of Fame right now that are basically, that were never particularly dominant, uh, you know, don't really deserve it. You know, anyway, who else is on the list? Um, so I mentioned Josh sitting over Brandon Scherf. Sin's just, I mean, in terms of pass protection, it's not, it's not even close. And still one of the best pass protecting guards in the league. 
So we have Scherf for 39 total pressures, hits, sacks, and, you know, blocks defeated this year in pass protection. Sitton, only 10 of those. So Sitton's lost only 10 times in pass protection. Scherf's lost 39. That's just night and day in terms yeah, of, you know, a, a, a position that's still like, maybe it's a run first position, but pass protection means a lot. That's a huge gap. So I, I was surprised Scherf went. Scherf was one of those guys who... I was shocked. I didn't expect him to go this year. I th- you know, another step forward mm-hmm. next year, maybe. But I was, I was surprised to see him this year. I didn't think he would have that cachet already. But like you said, former first Top round pick, pick, he's he's in. Just get. Mm-hmm. And then after the O line, uh, so in the NFC, I think they just got the defensive ends wrong. I mean, Cameron <laughs> Jordan and Brandon Graham were the two best defensive ends, not only in the NFC but in terms of that position. I think the whole NFL for the Pro Bowl, you know positional designation those guys have i think they're top five each in terms of total pressures they're both dominant against the run and they put in the seahawks duo who i mean i i think i feel like seahawks fans have been pretty upset with their pass rush this year i think you know watching their games their defensive line is not nearly as dominant as it has been in years past now those guys are having amazing seasons but uh they both make it also everson griffin where did he come from I mean, he's been good. Uh, I don't think. Ever I don't seen, even know if he's I been the best defensive end on the Vikings. Yeah, I mean that's debatable itself. He goes up against left tackle, so as opposed to which always going to be harder. True, but I don't know if he's been. I certainly don't know that he's been Pro Bowl worthy and worthy. Uh, and the biggest one though is that they've left off Cameron Jordan, who is. Oh yeah, that's what I said. Cameron Jordan and Brandon season. Graham. I mean, you see, Brandon Graham, I can at least understand because he's the guy that never gets the sacks. So that's mm-hmm. gonna that's gonna piss off people who want their pass rusher to be finishing. They want them to be getting guys to the ground. They want to get those sacks. Um, and there are gonna be people that even if you even if they know exactly how he's playing, they're not gonna give him the credit he deserves because he doesn't get the sacks. But Cameron Jordan has been just unstoppable this year for um, the Saints after you know a little ropey start right at the very beginning of the season but basically since then he's been completely destructive um and actually has sacks he's got like eight of them i think Mm -hmm. um and a ridiculous ton of pressure how on earth does he not go no and it's crazy me came to run and feel like it's underrated year after year because he also never comes off the field like he plays probably about 90 percent of the snaps every game he's you know consummately on that you know left side dominating what you know you just can't run to his side because he's so good and you know just gets overlooked consistently because of the sack totals because he's not a you know bend the edge guy you know speed get the sack but man he he deserved it and that's maybe the biggest snub in my mind five straight years of more than 91 percent of the same snaps for uh for cameron jordan um is that the end of our snub list or we got one more i had i had two more actually two more. so i Terrence Newman, I thought, deserved it over his teammate, Xavier Rhodes. Uh, I mean, we've talked about Newman at nauseum. Dude's just been ridiculously good. Only 4.19 yards per target this year for Terrence Newman. That leads the entire NFL. When you, when you look at the worst quarterback in the NFL, only averages about 5.5 yards per attempt. So he's turning basically every quarterback he's faced this year into far worse than the worst quarterback in the NFL when he's targeted. So Terrence Newman, I think, deserved it. Uh, not to say Xavier Rhodes hasn't been good, but Xavier Rhodes a lot of penalties, a lot of other stuff. Uh, just not been as good as Newman. And then the last guy is Sean Lee. I thought deserved it over Thomas Davis. Davis is probably the biggest how did he make it uh, out of anyone that I saw this year. You know, it, it, Considering he made it at outside linebacker where yeah, it includes a lot of those right. pass rushers. And he's just like every one of us, even if you go by raw stats, they're all way down. Like his tackle numbers, his, uh, you know, stop numbers, coverage numbers, they're all way down. So I I don't think he deserved it at all. So, yeah, that's where I'm going to go next. So we've done Thomas Davis. Let's look at the guys that are currently on this Pro Bowl team, the NFL shows, that have no real business being there. Um, Thomas Davis is one. One that jumps out to me is we've done the defensive ends as well for the NFC. Um, the well, one I think is <laughs> Richard Sherman. I, Richard Sherman's been pretty testy this year. He's you know threatening to have reporters' uh, credentials revoked. He's given up a couple of touchdowns to Brandon Marshall. Um, I can't remember who got him with the second one, but Sherman's given some stuff up. He's you know not been the shutdown guy that he's been in years past, um, and I, that's that's a pure name recognition one. I think. 
Uh, I, I still think Sherman has more value than maybe our grades might suggest, uh, just because you know teams basically will avoid him more than they'll avoid other corners. Now that some of that is because they know where he's going to line up, but the fact is he's only been targeted 66 times all year, which is like s- extremely low for a starting level cornerback in the NFL. I think you know Malcolm Butler has been targeted 87 times. A lot of guys are up near 100. To be only targeted 66 times and give up 31 catches, that's still pretty good. Yeah, but Stephon, I mean, I don't, I don't hate it. Stephon Gilmore has been targeted 63 times, has 38 <laughs> catches, and Gilmore has been, you know, pretty crappy. Patrick Peterson, 63. You know, like it's it's low, but it's not, you know, it's not Namdi Asimov where the teams just literally oh, stop throwing it in his direction. Like it's it's only going to affect him so picks. much. And I don't know. I, I don't. I don't hate it. No, I think it might, like, he might be worth a little bit more than the grades suggest, but I, it's clearly a down season for him compared to where he's Oh, yeah, it's past. definitely a down season. Um, and I don't there really are, see There it. are worse guys making the list, though. I think Reggie Nelson for the Raiders is also one of the most egregious ones. You even ask Raiders fans, and they're like, the dude was a, <laughs> he was a liability at times this year well, for safety, them. So. Safety is such a mess because of this designation and because you're only allowed to choose one strong safety and you have to have two free safeties. Whereas almost all of the league are effectively strong safeties, and then you have a few deep ranging free safeties. So you end up having to, you know, you pick the best strong safety in the league in either conference, and then you have to skip over like half a dozen guys to get to the first eligible free safety, and you end up with, you know, guys like <laughs> that are in there at the moment. Yeah. It, it, it made absolutely no sense that Eric Berry and Eric Weddle were competing against each other for one spot when, <laughs> like, that there should be multiple opportunities for both to make it because you know, they're both safeties. They both split, basically split time between free and strong safety. So to designate them one or the other is just asinine. Yeah. I mean, the, the way they've designated the safeties is ridiculous. They clearly have no idea who's actually playing in which. It must be done just by you know body what, size. They, what they're assigned. <laughs> you know, either body size or how the teams list them or something entirely arbitrary. Um, yeah. But even if you accept that, you need to change the you need to change the weight. You need to change which one gets two spots because there's way more strong safeties than free safeties right now. So if mm-hmm. you're going to do it that way, it should be two strong and one free as opposed to the other way around. Um, who else have we got on this list that really doesn't belong there? I don't think Dak Prescott belongs in the Pro Bowl to be honest. Oh, uh, eh, he's played well. He yeah. has two just awful games. The, the thing is. I, I, w- I do want to know, just from Cowboys fans, if, in all honesty, would they rather have Dak Prescott this season or Drew Brees or Matt Stafford? That's and if, Yeah. Like, I even think if you're a Cowboys fan, you're thinking, if I could have Drew Brees instead of Dak Prescott, I might go with Brees. Because just for this season, not, you know, not long-term or anything. Yeah, but, yeah. this year. But, yeah, those guys have been pretty lights out in terms of passing the ball, whereas Prescott, uh, you know, no knock against Prescott. He protects the ball very well. But very limited in what he's done. A lot of underneath stuff. You know, it's just I don't. Yeah, I don't think you deserved Pro Bowl, but I don't. I don't think it's egregious again. All right. What about um, Gerald McCoy? That appears to be. I got a lot of sacks, so I'm in the Pro Bowl. McCoy's a good pass rusher. I, I don't hate guys who maybe sell out for, as pass rushers and can do it well. I think he has what our seventh highest pass rushing grade among interior guys. So yeah, his there are guys with higher grades, but again, he's a good pass rusher. I don't think I hate the pick. All right, one one I, one I say I, I think got in that I a few I'll say that I don't like are guys who missed four games due to suspensions. I don't <laughs> I don't think that should be. You have only played seventy percent of the sne- season at this point. I don't think you should be, really be eligible uh you know for the pro bowl roster uh trent williams tom brady i, I realize tom brady is playing at the highest level of any quarterback in the nfl but you take the I, and i know he had a capable backup for those games that he missed but you can't assume a capable backup if a guy misses four games you know you assume a replacement level player for those four games i don't i just don't think a guy uh those two should be uh in the pro bowl i'll say yeah, I don't really have a problem with that. It's it's reducing the amount of time, but the, especially with guys like Brady and Trent Williams, who are both, I think, the best player at their position this season. I'm 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 not taking a guy out for four or just because he's missed four games. Um, who else is in there then that you don't think deserves a spot since you're shooting down all mine? 
And then last, I, th- I think Michael Bennett, for very similar reasons as well. He missed a few games. He's only played 472 snaps on the season so far. That's uh, that's half of what someone like Olivier Vernon's played at this point. So he's only played half the snaps of a guy you know, of other defensive ends. And then he just hasn't been the pass rusher that we've seen. He only has three sacks. I mean, this is one uh, for a guy who got overlooked for so many years. This one's a pure reputation play again. I don't. I think he's the third best pass rusher on that team at this point, and he still made it. Another guy I don't think deserves to be on there, even though it's a great story, is Lorenzo Alexander. Um, racked himself up a bunch of sacks, Aww. especially early in the season, but he just has not. He was never playing as well as the sack totals indicated, and if anything, he's died off as the years gone on. I like it. I, 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 I'll you just want the nice the story. man a lifetime. Yeah, I like. I like the fact that you know. He came it just his whole story is ridiculous, switching position multiple times, being one of the best special teamers in the NFL. And then all of a sudden, you know, he gets a chance to start for once and, you know, plays lights out. I'm fine with it. Uh, you, <laughs> you can have one or two, you know, good story picks in there. You're part of the problem, problem. Mike. You're, this is why <laughs> the, the Pro Bowl is getting watered down is because you're fine with picks like uh, Lorenzo Alexander because it's a nice story. So let's give Lorenzo the free Who you put in? Uh, name, a, name a guy who you're putting in over him then. In the AFC? We're talking like he's like our 25th ranked edge Yeah, I guess Mel, Melvin Ingram could. Ingram could is go. merciless there. Merciless could go. You could go quite deep before you got anywhere near uh, Lorenzo Alexander, I think. Keep um, in. I'll pick. The other guy I think that's gone almost as a lifetime achievement award, which, again, this will be one that you're fine with, is Jarrell Casey. Jarrell Casey definitely deserves to be a pro bowler. I'm just not sure it's this season. I like Jarrell Casey. I know. He's a good player, but I don't think he's been quite pro bowl worthy this year. Um, And also, I'm not sure that Marcus Peters deserves to be there again. So this is the PFF hating Marcus Peters thing coming back. Are you going to stick up for Marcus Peters? Uh, I'm fine with it again. Again, it's, it's not egregious. You're just fine with anything that's even in the ballpark. If a I guy's would, played okay, you're good with it. I, I, yeah, I mean, I can't hate if a guy has played fairly well. And there's not, and it's basically if there's not a guy off the top of your head who's played, you know, much better. If the other guy you're putting in has played somewhat better, and you're just kind of like, this, you're just kind of quibbling between, you know, two very good players. Eh, like, I'm not going to lose sleep. You're keeping your boy uh, Byron Maxwell out there. Ma- Maxwell is not my boy. Don't get that. <laughs> you, you were point talking up how well he's been playing all season. But Byron Maxwell out one stat about, about how he's exactly. not awful. It's more and... than anybody else has done. <laughs> Byron Maxwell's your boy. He really did. His reputation went pretty south. When, when you get a big contract and you play as bad as he did, I mean, you're asking for it, though. All right, I've got one. Right. What, there is no way that Mike Tolbert deserves to be in the Pro Bowl. Oh, I completely forgot about that. Oh, my God. The, the fact uh, – how many Pro Bowls is this for him now? I got to look that up. Because Mike Tolbert it, is the only fullback that runs the ball. So he, <laughs> exactly, like he, he is a running back who's just fat for them. <laughs> like He's just a fat running back. Like he is, he doesn't block, he doesn't like lead block at like basically at all compared to other fullbacks in the league. But you know, they hand him the ball three to four times a game and all of a sudden pro ball. Yeah. So when people look it up, it's like, which fullbacks leading the league in rushing? Oh, it's Mike Tolbert. Cause he's, he's a running back. Three time pro bowler. And Mike Tolbert <laughs> goes to the pro bowl yet again. Yeah. That is ridiculous. Like if you want blocking backs, you're not looking at Mike Tolbert. Um, there are many that do it better. There are many that do it a lot more. Um, and it's, it's ridiculous. Like if you're, I mean, the, the fullback position has become kind of, um, you know, diminished anyway, but like you can't. All pro took it out. Do they? I think so. Wow. I know they were, what else have they done this year? They're adding, they've done that edge rusher, uh, defensive interior thing. They've also added like a kind of hybrid defensive bank thing. So a, a third or a fifth defensive bank that can be either a slot corner or a safety, I think. Um, that's I think good. That's what they've done. I don't. I didn't know that they dropped Everybody. fullback. Um, have they added in like a third wide receiver if they're dropping fullback, or are they just running with ten guys on offense? I don't know enough to. I didn't look that deeply into or it. Or maybe. But yeah, Mike Tolbert's back. averaging two point eight yards per carry this year. So those thirty-one carries, I don't know what the Panthers would do without him. 
nine gosh. nine different fullbacks have run blocked more than Mike Tolbert. And that doesn't sound like much, but you're talking about a position where there's like 20 fullbacks in the entire league that actually see any kind of meaningful snaps. Less, there's less than that, I feel like. I feel like it's oh, like 12. There's, yeah, there's, there's certainly less than that to do like a serious amount, but in terms of like <laughs> basically see the field at all. Yeah. Um, yeah, Mike Tolbert is ridiculous. Uh, who else have we got on this list? Or anyone else that we can, anyone else I can tear down the candidacy of while I'm there? No one that really stuck out to me. Um, can't argue with those punter picks. No, McAfee, who Hecker. Who could argue with the punters? Gordon would argue with those punter I'm picks. I'm sure he would. Uh, no, yeah. no. I, I thought they actually, I'll say this. I thought the offensive line was fairly well done this season. Um, some guys that, you know, minor quibbles, like I mentioned, uh, the center and guard there, probably the only two ones that I thought, like I would actually say didn't deserve to go or those two that I already mentioned, like the rest were fairly deserving. So there's that's, that's pretty, there. yeah, there's nobody, pretty good success for, yeah, there's nobody on the offensive line that sucks, which has not yeah, been the case in, in previous yeah. years. Uh, <laughs> you know, you've got guys that have gone in, in seasons past that have actually been terrible that year like actively bad um like the worst players this year have been above average so yeah that's a that's a pretty good job and actually a lot of these guys are pretty good and we're basically just quibbling over you know the fo- whether you're whether you're the fourth best player of your position just, or the yeah. seventh or whatever um so yeah that's that's a pretty good job actually in terms of offensive line certainly a massive step forward from where it's been in the past well done everyone retweeting them <laughs> Yes, well done, Twitter people. Um, they'll know TJ Clemmings in the Pro Bowl, and I think that's a shame for all of us. Um, I, I really did want that, uh, you know, that uh, that campaign for him to really get some legs. I'm kind of surprised that nobody hijacked any of those. Maybe tweets. it was he got actually the most of any tackle, but it's only a third of the vote, and he it's got true. absolutely it is, zero. It is possible. Okay. Um, I would like to see that the the fan vote because thing. that would have been the nail in the coffin for the Pro Bowl voting. Yeah. TJ Clemmings making it, but I was kind of surprised that, were, that there were no obvious, um, you know, hijackings of those tweet, uh, Pro Bowl tweet um, things where one had just gotten like absolute farcical player had gotten like you know a hundred thousand uh-huh. retweets or something just because everybody took it upon themselves to troll the Pro Bowl. Um, maybe I, I haven't seen the list nice. of uh, of top vote getters. Maybe it did happen. I just didn't notice. But that would have been fun, I think, if if TJ Clemmings had ended up with two hundred thousand retweets and. A Pro Bowl spot, or at least they had to actively nix him from the Pro Bowl. We'll, camp- we'll campaign for him next year. I think we should. He's- I think somebody needs to campaign for TJ because he's having a tough time of it. You know, every time TJ goes out there, he takes one step off the line, falls over. So it's been a rough year for him. Uh, I think he deserves a spot at Hawaii. I think he deserves that vacation. Well, it's Orlando, but okay. Oh, it's Orlando this year. Are they moving so. it around, or are they just have they just relocated to Orlando? I have no clue. <laughs> it's almost <laughs> like we don't care that much yeah. about the Pro Bowl. Yeah. Oops. It's, you know, we're not that invested in it. But, uh, yeah, like, I, I genuinely think that the Pro Bowl should be something worth celebrating. The The all-pro selection of uh, an NFL or of an NFL season should mean something. And it does still mean something, whether everybody, you know, that you talk to dismisses it as, as, a, as the farce it's become or not. These are meaningful recognitions, and though the you know an all pro might be a more meaningful thing, it's all subject to the same problems. We want to get the best guys possible recognized for their play because there aren't that many opportunities for those guys to get recognized. Um, so as much as I think you know everyone wants to laugh off the Pro Bowl, I do think it deserves some attention, and the league wants to you know, continually jazz it up and add gimmicks and all this kind of stuff. I think the single biggest thing they could do is fundamentally fixed the selection process and who they've actually got going or being selected, nominated for this award um, and not try and fix the, the kind of the aesthetics of it, fix the, the surface stuff, fix the, the building blocks and I think the rest will probably follow. Um, anyway, if you want to go, you can see Mike's write-up of the six biggest Pro Bowl snubs and the guys they should replace. You can also see our Pro Bowl team if you go to uh, profootballfocus.com. You'll be able to find that there. That's it for me and Mike and our Pro Bowl uh, reaction podcast, which wasn't a short, but is, you know, done. Uh, We'll be back tomorrow with Tuck to preview the upcoming games. Hope you enjoyed listening to this. Take it easy.